I'm going to talk about C Sharp and C Sharp 7. C Sharp, the, the point releases, so C Sharp 7.1, 7.2, um, they were released sort of uh, towards the end of last year and they didn't really get a great deal of fanfare. They didn't really get a lot of uh, attention, not much written about them and everything. And there's a few things in there that I wanted to learn some more about. So I did the best kind of thing when you want to learn something and say you'll do a talk on it because there's nothing like a deadline. Uh, and it's only when I started writing the talk did I realize why not many people have um, talked about it much, because <laughs> they're really dull. There's just point releases. The next 40 minutes or so is going to be tough. Just going to have to get through it, all right? Just, just bear with me. So um, what's the big deal with the point releases? Am I standing in the way? No. If we look back at the history of C Sharp, we'll see that this mostly major releases. So uh, C Sharp 1, 2002. Um, and then uh, that was followed in 2005 by C Sharp uh, 2 with some nice things with generics and uh, whatnot there. C Sharp 3 um, was two years later, uh, arguably the best in the series, clearly the prisoner of Azkaban of the um, C Sharp world. Um, VAR, anonymous types, uh, was it extension methods? Put that with anonymous methods and things and you've got a really elegant design for link. It's really, really nice, it's clearly the best. Um, again, three years later then for C Sharp 4. Um, hands up who uses dynamic? Well, more than I was expecting, I have to say. Um, and then, of course, another three years for async await. Great feature, big feature, but basically the only one in, uh, in that release there. Um, it, you can see what's going on. Big releases, big features, uh, and so on. And it kind of reached uh, with C Sharp 5, C Sharp 4 and 5, the number of features were slowing down and getting smaller. Uh, and that's because of the age of the code base, C++ and uh, old, and they needed to rewrite it. So they spent several years rewriting that. And that was C Sharp 6 with Roslyn, everything written in C Sharp and uh, all new and easy to extend and everything. And so they've got a whole load of new features then in C Sharp 6. Um, and that brings us to C Sharp 7.0, um, which was released in March last year. A bunch of interesting features there. We're not going to really look at these much because we want to look at the point releases. But the, the big thing which came out of this really was the, the point oh. It's the significant part there, and they actually called it out as well. So they said that traditionally they've tended to, um, to, to major releases, releases which are tied to Visual Studio releases as well. Uh, and um, because they had these sort of big bang releases every couple of years, uh, they kind of routinely dropped the, the, the .0 uh, specifier as well. Not strictly true. There was a C Sharp 1.2. Don't know what happened to 1.1, but there you go. Um, but that's really small. We don't talk about it much. So. Um, why have they done point releases now? Um, the, the answer is really to do with um, the fact that Visual Studio is getting updated more frequently. So Visual Studio 2017, I think it's on its fifth um, minor release. Um, the sixth one is already in preview. And, and so they don't have to be tied to uh, releases of Visual Studio anymore. And because that's being updated more frequently, they can actually release C Sharp more frequently too. And it gives you, instead of having to wait years to get new features, you can get them um, uh, sooner and use them sooner. Uh, yeah. So that's what we've got. We've had C Sharp 7.1 released in August last year, 7.2 released in November. 7.3 is uh, in progress. It's being worked on right now. There's some interesting features going on in that. Uh, and then, of course, they're still working on C Sharp 8, some bigger features going on in C Sharp 8. Um, no timelines for the, for the last two, though, so uh, don't know when those will be out. How do you get it? How do you get these point releases? Has anybody used the point releases, by the way? Okay, a couple, very good. Um, you've probably already got it. Um, if you've been keeping your Visual Studio up to date, you'll most likely have uh, the latest C Sharp compiler. Um, 15.3 introduced C Sharp 7.1. 15.5 introduces C Sharp 7.2. Uh, if you've got the latest .NET Core SDK, then you've already got C Sharp 7.2 as well. I don't really get how .NET Core SDK version numbers work, but I think 2.1 means it's for .NET Core 2.0. I think, I don't know. So um, you can target .NET Core 2.0 with C Sharp 7.2, so that's good. If you are cross-platform uh, and you're using Mono, then you can currently only get C Sharp 7.1. The latest stable release, five, Mono 5.8, includes C Sharp 7.1. There's too many points now, isn't there? Uh, the next version, 5.10, will have C Sharp 7.2. Everyone got that? One of the interesting things with the um, point releases is that you don't get them by default. They're off by default. The uh, project system will default you to the latest major release. So you have to opt into them. The idea is that if you have different team members on different levels of the tooling, 
you don't want them to have different compiler features. You want to make it more obvious and more easy. You have to explicitly opt into it. And so by default, you get 7.0. To change it, it's fairly straightforward. In Visual Studio, you can uh, bring up the project properties. You go to build, advance, C sharp level, and you get drop down. You get to change it. Uh, if you're using uh, Rider, it's just right click on the project, bring up the properties, and you get a similar drop down. And you get the choice of setting it to 7.0, 7.1, 7.2, latest or default. Latest means the latest actual version, so that will float up. If you have it to seven, uh, if you set it to latest, when 7.3 is released, you'll just get 7.3. If you have it to default, it's the latest major version, and so that'll be 7.0. When the next big release happens, that'll become 8.0. And of course, you can just edit the um, project file manually. That's what the drop down does. So when you change the drop down, it'll just set that element in your CS project file, and you're good to go. By the way, if anybody has any questions at any time, please shout out. What do we get? What do we get with our terribly exciting C sharp releases? Well, 7.1, it's pretty small, actually. Not uh, many things, about four items on the list there. Quickly go through them. It's only slightly painful. Um, the first one is async main. It's actually quite a nice little feature, really. Um, if you have written any async code, you'll realize that it kind of goes viral. If you, have, uh, if you want to await on a particular async uh, method, you have to mark your own method as async, and if somebody wants to call you, they have to use await and mark their method as async, and so on, all the way up to main. And in the end, you end up writing some boilerplate like this. Do something, get a waiter, get result. It's not terribly nice. This is a little feature which means you can write that. You can mark the main method as async, and behind the scenes, the compiler will generate uh, an alternative entry point for you. And the alternative entry point simply calls that. It's nice and easy. Next one is um, default literal expressions. So this is the whole default of T, how you get like a, a default value for something, whether it's a, a null value, or if you're doing default of int, it's a zero. Um, this allows you to drop the type name out of that expression if it can be inferred. So it's useful for things like uh, default um, arguments. You know, string s equals default string. What's the point of writing string there? We already know it. So we can drop it there. Same again with the variable assignments and when you're calling a method as well. You know what value that is, so why have to put default bracket string? Infer tuple element names. This is, you know, great. We had tuples in 7.0. Uh, you had to give them a particular specific name, like company. Now it'll just pick it up from based on the variable name, like it did with, um, like it does with anonymous types. Uh, and then finally for 7.1, we've got um, reference assembly generation, and basically you're not going to care about this one. It's it's mostly for people like the core framework who need to build NuGet packages, which have different implementations for different platforms, um, and therefore can have different APIs in there, different public APIs, but they want to give you one known good set of APIs for reference. And so that is a reference assembly. It's got no implementation in it at all. All the method bodies simply throw, uh, and it's removed all the private stuff, and it's just used by the compiler to, to reference, uh, yeah, as, as a reference. Previously, they've been building these uh, reference assemblies with a custom tool, but why not let the comp compiler does it, do it? The compiler has all this information. It can build it dead easy, so that's what's happened. So, yay. Everybody excited about C Sharp 7.1? Someone. All right, 7.2, moving swiftly on. Again, small list of items, um, non-trailing named arguments, not terribly exciting. We've had named arguments before with optional parameters, uh, but normally they sit at the end of a method call, so that you can move things around, you can leave things out, you can have them in any order you want. This allows you to put the values, uh, sorry, the names in the middle of the call, and it's really useful for um, improving the expressiveness, which I don't think is a word, but we're going for it. Um, expressiveness of your primitive type. So if you've got a method call with a lot of uh, Boolean literal values in there, what does true, false, 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 true mean? You can now put the labels in. So it gives you kind of like a, an annotation there. Incidentally, this can be fixed with tooling. IntelliJ will have sort of parameter hints for certain languages like Java, Kotlin, PHP. Rider doesn't have it for C Sharp yet, um, but it would be nice to see. Either way, it would be nice to have that there. It's, a nice, it's actually a nice little feature. Um, we've also got then um, access modifiers. Uh, so we've got public, private, protected, internal. We've had protected internal for ages. Protected internal is for uh, accessing a type member uh, from a derived type or uh, another type in the same assembly. So it's protected or internal. 
the CLR has been able to do this one protected and internal, and now C-sharp can have it. So this, that means that you can mark a type as being accessible by any derived type only within the same assembly. Hands up who needs that? Right. Okay, so, um, final piece then for C-sharp 7.2 is uh, reference semantics with value types. Um, this is an interesting set of uh, language syntax. It's a whole new bunch of uh, keyword modifiers to allow us to do sort of interesting things with value types and references, and hang on a minute. This is really interesting. This is now all of a sudden a big feature because if we look at it, we've now got a whole vocabulary for working with value types as references, especially if we pull in something from C-sharp 7.0, which is uh, what I'm standing right in front of, um, ref returns and ref locals. So that's a, another cool feature. Put them all together, and we've got a way of working with value types in a, uh, a really useful manner. But what does this mean? What does it mean to have reference semantics with value types? Well, um, the, put simply, it just allows us to use value types as the, in the same way that we can with references. So we can uh, pass by reference everywhere. So uh, we don't have to copy um, value types around everything, and we can use this to reduce allocations, reduce copying of value types, uh, and reduce memory traffic. And uh, this is a good thing. This all leads to sort of performance optimizations, um, but it's important to point out these are low-level performance optimizations. So there's a good chance that you and I won't use this day-to-day, -day, but it's gonna be really key because this is gonna get used in the framework. So if you are using um, .NET Core and the .NET, um, what's the name of the web server for .NET Core? Thank you, Kestrel. Then they'll be using this and that will make their layer much faster. They'll be able to do a whole load of requests with better throughput because there'll be less allocation. Less allocation means less garbage collection uh, and they, that will improve um, uh, performance, import, improve throughput. It'll also get used in games where you don't want to have lots of pauses for garbage collection. So you'll be able to reuse these value types and pass them around, and it's all good. Um, it should also be used in parsing. We'll, we'll see a little bit of that later. Um, and that, you know, so if JSON.NET, for example, starts to pick up this, your serialization, deserialization is gonna improve. So basically, this is a good thing. Right, let's have a bit of a, a refresher here and what's the difference between value types and reference types. I'm talking about it like it's brilliant and everything, but what does it mean? If we look at the difference between the two, if you have a reference type, this is the class keyword. We all know this. So if you have a value type, it's a struct um, keyword. The kind of the big difference when we are talking about these uh, in this particular circumstances is that a class is, reference, is allocated on the heap over there somewhere, and the um, value type is allocated on the stack. Uh, and this is really important. It's really useful. Uh, it's not always um, allocated on the stack because you can embed a uh, value type into a class object and it becomes part of the size of that class object. A variable to a reference type is a reference to the thing on the heap, uh, whereas a variable to a value type is the thing itself. So if you think of an integer, you're not gonna put an integer on the heap and have a reference to it, that's just wasteful. But in the same way, if you have a struct which describes a point or a vector, then the, the variable for that point or vector contains all the data, and that's uh, all part of it there. References are passed around by reference. So if you have a reference to something on the heap, when you call a method, you can say, oi method, it's over there, it's on the heap. And the method can use that, and it'll point to the same thing, and it'll talk to the same thing. Which means that uh, changes to that object, they will see the same object. Whereas if you have a, an actual value, that's uh, passed by value, which means it's copied. So you give it to the, uh, the method itself. You don't uh, point to it, you just give it to the, to the method, uh, and it gets a copy. Um, other useful things which are important here is that if you do an assignment uh, for a reference type, it's just copying the reference, so you end up with the same pointer, uh, pointing to the same object. Whereas if you do an assignment, even in a method call to a value type, you get a new copy. So you're not always working with the same data here. Uh, and the final thing to point out with value types is something we probably all know about is boxing. Um, that's not applicable in this instance, but that's when you want to refer to a value type as an object, and that then gets copied over to the heap and everything, and that's quite expensive. So what do we mean by stack allocation? So the, the stack, um, the heap's over there, remember? The stack's here. Um, what the stack does is that every time you have a method call, it, the method reserves some space on the stack, and that's the space then for all the local variables. Um, when you uh, call another method, 
you put some more memory on the top, you push some space onto the stack uh, and allocate for those local variables. If you call another method, it's like a stack. At the end of the method call, it pops it and it goes away. It pops it and it goes away. So what's really useful there is that you have um, a particular lifetime constraint. And it's also um, that those local variables are only valid for the lifetime of that method call. And if you've got a value type where the data is the thing, then that is actually embedded in that stack there. So it's cheap. Allocation there is cheap. You just kind of move your stack a bit, and it's constrained lifetime. When it's gone, it's gone, it's done. And it all sort of cleans up nice and easy. So one thing you could do to sum it all up, really, is you can say that allocating a reference type has a cost, but passing it around is cheap. However, allocating a value type is cheap, but then passing it around has a cost because it's copied everywhere. Why can't we have both? And that's what this feature is all about. So um, passing by value or passing by reference. Um, I think I've probably covered this already, actually. Uh, the one thing that I want to point out here is that um, the copies, when you have a value type, uh, they're not actually all that expensive. So it, it is, there is a cost involved, but it's not massive. So if you've got a, a, a 3D point, for example, there'll be three floats, for example, there, that could be like 24 bytes. So it's not a big deal that these things get uh, copied around, but the better the thing you know the only thing better than, um, than than allocating 24 bytes is allocating no bytes. So if you are in a tight loop, um, doing lots of allocations, even in a small amount there, we can improve that by not copying anything around. I'll skip that one as well. Um, okay. To work with this, we kind of need some building blocks for the vocabulary that we're talking about here. And the first thing is the 7.0 feature, which is ref returns and ref locals. So a ref return is um, the ability to return a reference from a function. So a method, uh, currently you can return like a, re a reference object, you can return a string, and that's fine. If you return a value type, it gets copied. And so here we are, we're dealing with copies again. Uh, we've got traffic, memory traffic, and churn, and so on and we want to sort of reduce this. This is stuff that the CLR can already do, so the C-sharp is just exposing it. So we change the method to return a reference type, and this actually involves changing the, um, the, the method signature itself. So instead of returning int, you return int reference, and the ampersand there is how the CLR references that, um, describes that. This introduces some constraints. The lifetime of the return value uh, must not, uh, sorry, it must exceed the lifetime of the called method. So because we were on the stack, you can't have a variable in that stack because once the method ends, it's gone, and that reference is dead. But if you have a reference to a field, then that's fine because the field lives longer and that reference is still valid. If you modify the reference, it's the same as modifying the original value because it is the original value. So this is a good thing. So one of the things which were useful there was if you have an array, you can return a reference to the cell of the array, and you're, you're editing that as a, just like a normal value, but it's actually gonna change the contents of the array. Uh, and the way to work with this then is you add the ref modifier. You add the ref modifier to the return type in the method signature, and also to the return statement. Uh, and for various reasons as well, you're not allowed to use this on async methods. You can only use this on normal method calls mainly because of the call stacks and so on. But that's only one side of the equation. To use this, you need to have ref locals as well. Because if you, have, if you return back a reference to a, um, to a value, and then you assign it to a variable, and that variable is just a, uh, a value type, then it's a copy, because the, the thing you're trying to um, assign it to is not a reference. So you have to call it, make that a reference as well. And so that's what ref local is. It's a value type, sorry, it is a local variable that is uh, a reference type. Um, type inference with var will get you the type, but it won't get you the reference qualifier, so you have to do ref var, and it works. All right, so let's have a quick look at how that works. All right, can everyone see that okay? Marvelous, right, so I've got, um, a struct here is just a simple two-dimensional um, struct. It's a, a point class, two uh, mutable values, x and y, and, and we get to create it with a constructor. I then have a reference type um, enemy, which has a location with my point here, and I, I create that from, uh, from the constructor. 
I also have a method then to get location, and this will return me back uh, my location as a point. So I've got a couple of tests here, and th this is what we're doing here. So first of all, we create our enemy, and then we call get location. And we're going to assign that to a, um, uh, a variable, and that's going to be a variable of type point. Uh, and what's happening here is this is, this is the first um, example. It's a copy. This is not going to be the reference. I'm not returning by reference now, I'm returning by value. And so this is a copy. So if I modify the X location of my point, set it to 12, it doesn't matter, it's ignored. It doesn't affect my enemy class at all. It only actually um, affects the copy I've got. So I then assert that with my test and I say, well, is the X value the same as it was originally? We can run this test. Quickly builds, and that goes green, and that's true. So we're working with a copy there. We haven't changed the original data, we've changed the copy. Now I've got a second method, get location by ref, and I've changed the way that the uh, return signature is, uh, is defined here, and I've got a ref point, and I have therefore had to change the way that the return statement is written as well. I'm doing return ref location. So this is gonna return me back a, a a reference to the field in the class. Right, and so I've got a second test here, and I do the same thing. I create an enemy with point uh, x set to 10, and I can call get location by ref. But this is a copy, because this is a var, a var which if I specify that uh, directly, it's a point, it's not a point reference. So that one gets me a copy. If I set that, it doesn't matter, I'm working with a copy. If I then check it against the one in enemy, it'll be 10, it'll, it'll stay as it was. So I haven't modified the original value. I've modified a copy. But what I can do instead is I can call my get location by reference uh, with the ref keyword modifier and also assign it to a ref variable as well. And this will now work just with, uh, with references. And if I change the value to be location x is 12, that's actually gonna affect it in the, um, in the class instance as well. And so if we run that now, we should see that's green. Oh, I'm standing on the green bit. Um, let's move that. How do I move that over? All right, so we've got a green test. So, so that's good. So we're working with, um, we know now when we're working with a copy of the item and when we're working with a reference, and when we work with a reference, we actually change the item because we're referring to the same item. This also allows us to do something slightly wacky as well, which is that we can have now a method as the left-hand side of a uh, assignment. So I can do enemy get location by ref equals new point 42, 42. And if we run that, you know, I assert this is true. And yeah, we've got a green test over on the right. So we can do some wacky things with that as well, although that, don't, don't do that, that's just not nice. All right, so um, that's ref returns and ref locals. Um, does everyone get that one, is that okay? Cool. How are we doing for time? All right, C-sharp 7.2 then has now uh, builds on top of this and, and adds extra features then which is gonna be useful for working in the same sort of manner, passing these uh, value types around by reference. The first thing we get is really dark and hard to see. Um, you get an in parameter. Um, so with, on a method call, on a method definition of a, a method declaration, you can uh, put a, a modifier on the parameters to say out and ref. We're all familiar with those. Um, out is for saying that the value that you're passing in, whether it's a reference type or a va value type, the, uh, the argument is going to get set by the method. You've got ref as well, which means that it can be set by the, ref by the method. In is now a new one, and it's a similar sort of thing, but it is saying it's passed, being passed by reference, but the method can't touch it. So it's all about performance. It's saying, I'm passing it by reference, but you can't modify it. Um, and so one thing we see here is that the compiler uh, enforces the safety uh, by creating a defensive copy. So if you call a method on this reference that you've passed in, the compiler goes, I don't know what that method's gonna do. That method might be mutating state, and the in parameter is saying that you're not allowed to mutate state, Therefore, I'm gonna make a defensive copy, okay? We can see that. 
uh, you know, over here. So I've got um, another type, uh, another struct type called mutable point. Uh, and this is something which I can mutate. I've got my translate in place method here, which is going to change the, the, the values of the struct, the actual instance of the struct itself, uh, and modify it. Um, and then I've got, ooh, hello. I've got another test, which hopefully will run. Let's get rid of that one. All right, it's done that. Um, okay, so this is just calling a, a method here. Uh, I've created a, a mutable point in my class, uh, sorry, in my test, so nothing massive going on here. If I call my translate in place, it does actually change the value, so this is, this is fine. Um, I've now got a, an, another test to show what's going on here. I'm gonna call the do translate method. Do translate has now got this in modifier here, and it's saying that this, uh, that means I can't change it. And if I, if I try to, well, I can't have made that into a read-only getter, so let's ignore that. But I can't modify anything in there. It would be a compile error if I try and call uh, one of the, set one of the fields in there or change the reference itself. But when I call translate in place, the compiler is going to make a, def uh, a defensive copy here because it doesn't know what's going on and it, is, it assumes the worst and it's, it's true in this case. So here I am saying, um, creating my mutable point, I'm passing it in by reference. My, refer my uh, reference method with the in parameter should be translating it to move it to 20, so the value should be 30, but it, the test is gonna show that actually it didn't change anything and it's all, um, it's all 10. And we've got a, a green test there and so we're okay. So we've got a defensive copy. We've passed by reference, that's good. You know, we're making use of this, but we've got a defensive copy made, which is not great. We wanted to avoid copies. So what can we do about that? All right, we'll come back to that. So uh, we've got another feature, which is ref read only. Uh, and this is another modifier. It extends ref returns and ref locals. Uh, and it's about returning values, sorry, ret yeah, returning a value type as a reference, but it says that the person you're returning it back to cannot modify it. So it's again, it's about uh, trying to be read only and passing things around by reference for performance, but don't change it. Um, the way this one works is that you assign to a ref var, but you add in the keyword read only to your method signature. Again, too dark to see. Let's have a look at it in code. So, okay, I have again a struct with my point. I've got my, uh, I've got mutable public fields here, I can change these. I've got a method, translate in place, this will modify the current instance again. And I've also got a couple of um, static variables and methods again in there. So, you know, imagine you've got a point class and the origin, which is at zero, zero, uh, and I'm gonna return back a reference to that because I don't wanna be copying this uh, point class around all the time. Um, but if, if we're not careful, we can modify that. We don't want to modify the origin because that's just gonna be crazy. It's gonna cause lots of problems. So if we have uh, a non-read-only return, and I try and do this, so I have var and I get my origin, I'm not pulling that back by reference, I'm actually getting a copy of that. And so that one asserts that even though I've set the value, nothing's happened. And that will work. Now let's open that a sec, and we've got green. So that's fine, that's, we, we, we know that already, that's, that's boring. But now let's return it by reference. And so if I have ref var and ref uh, point origin there, that's not a read-only reference. If I modify this, it's gonna stick, and that's not good. So if I run that, that test is also green, but now I've just killed origin, and I've just introduced a whole load of bugs into my 3D game, which is not leak compounded by the fact that it's a 2D point. Um, this test is commented out because this is a compile time error. This uh, ref read only here is what we want to see. I've modified, I've got a new modifier. Uh, I'm saying this is a read only reference and um, I'm getting back a reference uh, to the origin. If I try and set that, I get a compile time error and it says the left hand side of an assignment must be a variable property or indexer. Basically it's saying it's read only, you can't do it. So that's good, that's, that's working nicely. 
But what happens when I call translate in place? So um, I've returned back a read-only instance, and I want it to be um, immutable. The compiler enforces it if I try and set a value on the field. But what happens when I call a method? That's going to cheat. But what happens is that the compiler, again, it, it knows that um, it, it doesn't know what's going to happen on the method, so it will uh, create a defensive copy again for me. And even though I set the value, I can now assert that I'm at zero and my tests pass and I'm all green. So that's fine. I've worked on a, a copy. But again, I've got a defensive copy and we're trying to avoid copies. How do we work around this? Two last features. Read-only struct is one of them. Um, and this is where you can say, um, you can declare the struct itself as being read-only and the compiler will enforce all these things and it will stop making a defensive copy. It says you can't modify this. And the way it does this, if you put the read-only modifier in the struct, it means that all of your fields have to be read-only, so it's immutable. If, it's, if your fields are read-only, your methods themselves can't uh, modify the current instance um, because that's how read-only works, and um, everything's good. The compiler knows that it's, you, it's immutable. You can't make any copies. It doesn't need to make any copies. The syntax is nice and easy, public read-only struct. It enforces the fact that I've got to have read-only fields, so now I'm immutable. And now my translate in place is actually a compile time error. I can't build it. Uh, and now if I modify things, again, it's compile time errors because it's a read-only field. I can't do anything with it. And I'm getting back a, a reference to it, and everything's good. So basically now my origin is going to stay at zero, and my game is going to make millions. So we're awesome. Uh, right. So one of the best things as well is that there are no changes to the CLR for this. This is all, you can use this on any CLR and everything's great. It's stuff that the CLR has already been able to do. Um, it's just now C-sharp is exposing it and allowing you to do it. And again, these are micro-optimizations. These, these are small things. Um, but if you find yourself in a tight loop, then um, you're going it, to, it's something you can reach for and something you can use. And again, the compile, no, sorry, the, the platform will make use of this and you'll benefit from it. All right, one last feature for C Sharp 7.2, um, ref struct. This one is uh, an interesting one because it puts some, uh, puts some constraints onto structs. It's basically saying that this struct can only ever be allocated on the stack. So in my enemy class, I had an embedded uh, point, that's a struct, uh, but that means that that particular point struct lives on the heap because enemy lives on the heap. What we're doing here is we're declaring that this particular struct can only ever be uh, built on the struct. And so this, this gives us several useful constraints. It constrains the lifetime to the calling method. So because we, things live on the stack and you push things onto the stack and pop things off, you've got a known lifetime of that, uh, that item. Other interesting constraints mean that it can't be boxed because when you box it, it goes onto the heap. Um, you can't use it with async methods or iterators because those, get, those uh, methods get rewritten uh, and things get captured uh, and put into, onto the heap. Uh, and it can't be a generic parameter because there's too many ways you can use a generic par parameter to, so that it ends up on the, uh, on the heap. And so there are very limited use cases for this. It's a really, really niche feature. First of all, you can use it with the stack alloc keyword. So stack alloc allows you to allocate a block of memory on the stack, which is great, uh, and pass that around and, and work with it. But the big use case is for span of t. Span of t is going to be um, the next big thing. Um, it's really, really useful, and um, it's going to um, make lots of changes in the way we write uh, software. Cool, that's grand, isn't it? Um, basically, it's a, it's a new type that unifies working with um, blocks of memory. With if, as long as the memory is just in one block, then uh, this will, you can use span of t with it. So it doesn't matter whether the um, the memory is an array, uh, or string data, or native memory, or stack alloc memory. You've got the same API for working with that. You, you, you just sort of wrap it in a span, and the span then gives you array-like access to it. It's just getters and setters, uh, and so on. Um, it's also type safe, so it's span of t. That means each element in this sort of pseudo array is of type t, and you can get at that uh, very nice and easily. Uh, and you have array-like performance. It's not quite, but they're working on it, and um, Thing, things are improving. So um, the type works, well, we'll come back to that. 
Uh, the other really cool thing you can do with it, and this is the really big thing, is that you can support slicing. So you can have a span, which is uh, of a certain block of memory, and then you can have another span, which is a slice of that, which is a shorter chunk of memory. But you haven't allocated anything because you've got a reference struct. So the struct isn't allocating anything here. It's um, because it's, it's living on the stack. And you're not blocking off that, you're not copying that block of memory at all. You're just referencing it. So how is it built? How does it work? Um, it's a NuGet package. It's system.memory. It's still in pre-release. They're still uh, finishing it off, finalizing it, working on it, whatnot. Uh, and it's for the .NET standard 1.1 and above. Who knows what .NET standard 1.1 is? Yeah. So it's .NET Framework 4.5 and above and .NET Core. Well, nobody uses .NET Core 1 anymore. .NET Core 2.0 and above. Uh, it introduces the type. Uh, new APIs and overloads are coming into the, the base class library itself. Um, they're not added by the package. Um, but they, they're going to be part of the base class library. So things like uh, stream, read, async. So the idea is if you can wrap a block of memory and uh, you can have that memory in any way, read and writing, it just needs to sort of access the characters in that array. Uh, and so reading and writing is perfect for this. You can do that. And if you can have a slice within that span, then you can do substrings uh, very cheaply as well. And you can, that's really great then for things like parsing. So there's a, a UTF-8 parser as well. And things like tripars for uh, integers, you can then parse it without having to allocate or reallocate um, and everything. There are a couple of associated types with it. Span of T, you can have a read-only span of T, which is the same memory but no, get, uh, no setters. Uh, and then there's memory of T as well, which is uh, a bit more uh, complex. It's about being able to put the object onto the heap. We won't go into that right now. But uh, span of T is much more interesting. So performance-wise, there are two versions. There's a portable version, and then there's a fast version. Uh, it's, I've, I've been told to point out that the portable version is fast enough. It's, it's not slow, it's portable. Um, what this means is that uh, the fast version has special runtime support, whereas the portable version doesn't. Uh, and so it is slightly slower, but it's still good enough. So as I say, portable works on um, everything from .NET 4.5 and above, and .NET Core. Um, the fast version is, um, I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, yeah, so, so we're not as fast as arrays with the portable version. It is slightly slower, um, but it's uh, a very, very convenient API all the same. The way this one works is that there are three fields in the struct. You get a pointer to the da data itself, an offset within that data where you're starting from, and then the length. So it's like saying, here's my block of memory, and you're referring to that bit there. And that's, that defines our uh, span. But then to access that bit of data, it has to go from there, add that, and then add your offset. So it's slightly less performant. The fast implementation is .NET Core 2.1 only right now. It will be rolled into .NET Framework at some point, um, but it is uh, currently uh, they're, they're only targeting .NET Core 2.1. This now only has two fields. It has a internal pointer. So where you have your block of memory, um, what it happens now is instead of having that and the offset within it, you point directly at that bit there, internal pointer, and that's a bit crazy, and the garbage collector doesn't like it, and that's why it has to be on the stack. Because <coughs> if there are too many of those, it gets very expensive to track, and also the JIT crashes, so uh, don't do that. Um, so it's a slightly smaller struct, and accessing your data now is slightly faster, so hence it's faster. Um, but also, on top of that, there are specific JIT optimizations. So if you are working with an array, if you do a for loop over an array, you don't, the, the JIT throws away the bounds check for every single access because it knows that you're making sure that it's uh, within limits at the start. The JIT does the same for span of T as well. And this now gives you very close to array performance. So what does this have to do with the ref struct thing? Well, um, there's a couple of issues with it. Um, tearing is one. If you need to update all of the fields atomically, you know, there's, there's three fields, two fields, they have to be updated at the same time. Otherwise, you've got a, a length and an offset to a, the wrong pointer. And if you're on the uh, heap, that's a bad thing um, because you could change it in one thread halfway through an operation, and it could be disastrous. Um, and the whole point of this is performance, so you can't put a lock around it. Uh, that would be uh, a waste of time as well. Um, so you want to constrain it to the stack because if you're on the stack, only one thread can access it at the time. Uh, internal points are expensive, and again, keeping that to a minimum and with just a few going on at a time is a good thing. 
And um, if you have, if this is designed to be able to wrap stack allocated memory, then um, the, the problem is, you know, how do you put that on a heap? Because as soon as it goes on the heap, your method could exit and your stack allocated memory could disappear. So you make span of t a reference struct and therefore it can only be used on the stack and all of these things go away, which is good. It also gives you a very constrained lifetime as well. So quick demo of how this looks. So this, this class, uh, sorry, this um, project has the system.memory package installed. And we've got a simple test of the span here. Uh, we've got a, a constant string. And what we're doing is we're using an extension method as span on, uh, on our string to get me back uh, the, to, to reference the string data as a span. So this is gonna be a uh, no allocations um, reference to an array effectively of the string data. Um, and what I can do here is get to a simple assert there just to make sure that the, the length of the span is the same as the length of the message, easy peasy. And, and not particularly interesting either. The, what is interesting is the slice method. Uh, the slice is all about substrings. And here we can, or depending on what data you're dealing with, uh, we can have a slice that begins at six and goes on to the end. And we can check now that world, the world length is the same as the slice that we've got there. But what we have here is an allocation free substring. And that's really cool, especially if you do a lot of parsing. Again, JSON.NET could you know, do great things with this. Uh, and then finally, there's another extension method on span with something like starts with, and it's checking that it starts with a similar span of hello. And what's going on there is it's basically comparing uh, character by character. There, it's not doing a string comparison, it's doing character by character because it's effectively treating it like an index. And we can just run that and we will see just green, basically, because we're asserting that all these things are true. So it's, it's very simple, it's a very simple API to use. If I wanted to get at any of the um, data in there, I just used my, um, a setter or a getter, uh, an indexer, sorry. Okay, so that's um, C-sharp point releases. Uh, to, so to, to wrap up then, um, it's moving to uh, small frequent releases. It's opt-in, you start with C, uh, 7.0, you have to opt-in to 7.1, 7.2. Um, I was very mean to say it was, more, it was boring. They're not really boring, they're, they're just kind of small. 7.1, it was really more about testing the process. That was how they described it. Making, you know, making sure they can do releases like this. They can do small, minor releases and service them and what have you. Um, and 7.2, the uh, whole reference semantics thing is, is brilliant. It's, it's really, really useful. It's, it's a very significant feature. It is potentially very niche. Um, you and I might not ever really use it, but we will make use of it. So that's, a, that's really good. Uh, and then finally, span of T is going to be very important to the base class library as well. So we're gonna get a lot of overloads with that. Uh, and if we need to do things with uh, which are performance critical, we'll want to use that as a type. Um, very, very quickly, what's next is uh, C-sharp 8. Uh, the big headline feature they've got here is nullable reference types. Uh, I'd like to dive in more on this, but we've only got two minutes, so we won't. Um, and nullable reference types, I like this because reference types are already nullable. So what does this mean? This, this basically means flipping it so that you opt in to make your reference types non-nullable. So here, string, non-null string is saying that is a non-null string. Um, that will never be null, is what it's saying. We've already got a syntax for representing nullable things. It's a question mark, and so that's what we're gonna have here. String question mark means this is a, a string which can be null. And so you're gonna have to write defensive code here to make sure you don't have a null reference uh, for, the, uh, for nullable strings. Uh, and the compiler is basically gonna have a lot of uh, analysis there to do uh, control flow, data flow, and make sure that you are checking wherever you can. It's not gonna be flawless. Um, the C sharp is too set in its ways to, uh, to be able to work around this completely, um, but it's gonna be a, a very good step in the right direction to getting uh, no, no what, no defensiveness thing. Be, yeah, work better with no. Um, and of course, <coughs> Richard and Ryder have had this for ages, but we won't go into that. Um, so finally, uh, some links. I'll step out of the way for this one if you want to take a, a picture. There's some really useful um, information on there. The What's New documents uh, from Microsoft uh, for, for 7.1, 7.2 introduce those, uh, introduce the features really usefully. Um, the reference semantics with value types describes all of this and explains what's going on, in a, uh, which is good. There is a nice 15-minute video by Jared Parsons on a describing span of T 
um, <laughs> which I think um, the, the automatic translation um, captions for that one described it working with manatees, which is <laughs> different. Um, Adam Sitnik has done a blog post about Span as well, and there's some benchmark figures in there. Um, I didn't mention them as to how fast they are because that was from July and things have changed, so I don't know what the benchmarks are now, um, but it, it'll, it gives you an indication of how Span work, uh, compares to standard arrays um, with the portable and fast references. Uh, and then there's a bit of a description about some of the compiler optimizations they've done for Span of T. Um, and so that, that's me. So if anybody has any questions, shout out. If anybody wants a sticker, go come and help yourselves. Uh, other than that, thank you very much.